It's good to see you. If you have a Bible, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, what we just saw, we have a, um, the, if you've been with us for some time, then you know that there are a couple seasons throughout the year where we take up a special offering. And um, as we are a part of a network of churches uh, in the world called the Southern Baptist Convention, um, what we do, what, what I'm most excited about in that, in that like partnership that we have is that we literally are a partner, partner with other churches uh, in the world where we give cooperatively to the gospel going out into the world, in, into our like, homeland here and into uh, the world. And so two times a year, uh, we give a a special offering and where a hundred percent of that offering goes to particular whether whether it be internationally or in the states and, uh, and at Easter time we take an offering called the Annie Armstrong Easter offering and uh, 100% of that offering goes to getting the gospel goes to what you just saw like getting the gospel to Minneapolis and and other church planners and missionaries in North America that are taking the gospel into places where there are few to no churches and uh, and bringing the good news of Jesus there and so we have a part in that. What I love that we're able to do is our missionaries are, that are sent out and our church planners are sent out, they're sent out funded. Um, and so they're able to go out and, and not have to worry about getting all this, all this funding, but they're able to, um, they're able at least our church planners to start the journey funded and, uh, and get it going. And that happens through our cooperative giving, through us giving together. And uh, so a portion of what we give every week of the year, uh, we send out and it goes all over the place. Um, but in particular times, and these two times, Christmas and Easter, uh, this offering, these offerings that we take, go 100% of it goes to, um, to these, these efforts, and particularly in, at Easter at, uh, for, for, for North America, for church planning and missionary efforts in North America. And so over the next few weeks through Easter, um, we will be, uh, you'll have the opportunity to give, we'll have the opportunity to give to, uh, to the Annie Armstrong, or Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And there are envelopes in the back of the seat if you want to give to that. And online, there's a, there's a place where you're in, a, in the drop down there, you can dedicate your offering, uh, your offering there as well. And so I um, so just want to encourage you to be praying about what God might have you uh, to give to that uh, as we move forward. Um, this morning, so because we have multiple services, we are, um, there, there are times, some things that happen in, the, in, the, in, in one service that you don't get in this service and, and, and vice versa. And so um, we actually had a baptism this morning in, uh, in the 915, and I wanted to t t tell you a bit about, we got a lot of these babies coming around here, and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Um, yeah, praise the Lord. And uh, but uh, we had a, um, we, we baptized Tristan Bullman this morning, and uh, Tristan, I believe is 22, and her husband's been coming here for uh, 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 some time now, and, and I wanted to just show you, kind of get caught up with what's, what's going on. Uh, I just wanted to share a bit about her story with you, and, and uh, I'd asked her, I said, hey, just, just to write out, like, kind of what was life like before you came to Christ, before you accepted Jesus? Because this is why we get in the waters of baptism. It is to proclaim that I belong to Jesus. And so, and she mentioned, and we, when we had, we had talked, she mentioned that there was just some, over the course of the years, she had built up some anger and some unforgiveness um, just due to family circumstances and some things that happened that were beyond her control. And, uh, and just kind of that was a growing kind of, issue in her life, just bitterness, unforgiveness, and, uh, and, and she just said, in hatred towards certain situations in her life. And uh, six months ago, her, her baby, uh, their, their baby Leela was born. And uh, let me tell you, just, I just got to tell you, this is crazy. Leela is named after her great, great, great grandmother, all right? Great, great, great grandmother, who is still living. All right, so there are six generations in this family that are still that are still living. That is phenomenal. Um, but uh, so it was. She said it was after her daughter was born. Um, so the whole time that she was expecting her, uh, said she just kept feeling the Lord's presence calling her to take the next step, next step within faith. And she said, "I was able to forgive the wrongdoings." And she says, "And I repented of my sin." 
and, and asked the Lord to guide me. And uh, she said, I'm ready to follow God's plan for my life. No longer want to live on my own terms. I'm ready to publicly say I am a child of God. And, uh, and so she went public today making known that she belongs to Jesus Christ. And we just celebrated with that with her, and we're just so thankful. And uh, we have others that are ready as well to be baptized and, uh, in the coming weeks, and uh, we are pumped. And if you know that you are, like you have given your life to Jesus, you've repented of your sin, put your faith and trust in Jesus, and you have not taken this step, listen, it is the first step of obedience to following Jesus. And so let's go. Let's go. On the back of your connection card, just, just indicate, I'm, I'm interested in baptism, and I will follow up with you. We'll have a conversation, and we'll go through that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we are, we landed to, we're landing today. So last week, uh, we went through this passage, and it kind of landed us, and it, we ended, it was kind of a bummer sermon, right? I'm not, and I'm not, I'm, honestly, today might feel that way to some of you as well, all right? Um, but it ended with Paul going, look, he's going to the Corinthians and saying, you guys um, seem to have got this all together. You've, you figured something else out, something out that I couldn't figure out, um, apparently, because You've got like honor, you've got, you're strong, you, you've got, but yet I'm weak. We're like the apostles, we are like, we're following Jesus and we're weak. We're, we're like being persecuted. We're being looked at as like fools. And, and, uh, and yet look at you, look at you. You've kind of figured this whole thing out. And uh, he said, but I look at our life and, and, and we are, here's what he, here's how he described it. He said, we're at the end of the line. Like, like, like men waiting for a death sentence. And when they heard that, that, that brought up a certain picture in their mind. And that, in Roman culture, what would happen is the Romans would go off to war. And then they would, when they came back, they would put, they would parade through the city and everybody would cheer about, you know, the Romans defeating the, whoever they defeated. And, and they would have the POWs that they captured at the end of the line. And they would bring them and they would drag them through the city as everybody celebrated. And they would drag them into the arena to have them eaten by lions while everybody watched. Everybody was in the stands with Caesar watching, or they would have them fight to their death. But one way or another, this was entertainment. They were watching, they were watching these people, the, the, these POWs come in and end their life. And it was just, uh, and it was everybody in the stands with Caesar was just like, this is, this is great. This is great. We're celebrating not only a Roman victory, but we're celebrating, like we get, we get some entertainment out of this. And Paul's like, this is what we're like. You guys are like comfortable. You guys are like held in honor and somehow you've done that. But I'm just telling you, we're like those at the end of the line being dragged into the arena. Like we have a death sentence on us. And so Paul is going, there really are two kinds of people, two categories of people. There are those that are up in the arena and they're, and, and they're comfortable. They're, they are, they are, they're all about safety and making the most of what they can get from this life. They are strong. They are held in honor and then there are those that are down in the arena. And these are the ones who are the weak ones. They are the reviled ones. They are the losers. They are the scum of the earth, Paul says. And he says, so my, what I'm doing is I'm calling for you to come out of the stands and into the arena with me, into the arena with the lions, because this is what Christianity is. Christianity is lived out in the arena. Christianity looks like suffering and being reviled. It looks like not having what everybody else says you just got to have in order to be happy. This is, this is the life of following Jesus, the life of a Christian. And so he says in verse 10, he says, we are fools for Christ's sake. I know, I know. Everybody looks at us and, and says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you, Corinthians, I don't know how you've done it, but you, you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To, to the, the present hour, we hunger and we thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and we are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And so Paul's laying it out, and he's laying it out to us today, even. He says, so which group do you belong to? Like, which one is you? Where, where do you fall into? And if you, and if you follow Jesus, and what Paul just described about his life doesn't describe your life, you've got to ask the question, well, why not? 
What, have you spent your life chasing ease and comfort? Have you found a way to be Christian and comfortable? Have you found a way to be Christian and strong? Christian and held in honor? And Paul's going, I'm just inviting you to be an imitator of me. I'm inviting you to come down into the arena that you need to consider what your life is about. The way of Jesus is not about climbing your way up to what the culture calls the good life. The way of Jesus is actually downward mobility, stepping down from the crowd and into the arena. And so this is where we left it last week. And so I told you this week we come back and say, okay, so why? Why, why does, is this the life of a follower of Jesus? Why does following Jesus look like being eaten by the lions? Why, did, why, does this, why, does, why is this our life? Why would anybody want this life? Why would anyone choose the weak and reviled scum of the earth life? And so here's the sermon today. I'm going to give you three reasons. Three reasons why this is the life that we are called to. This is the life of a follower of Jesus. One, because it's good for you. It's good for you. So on on one level, this this is something that just living life tells us. Like, this is, like, you know this. Like, I don't, you don't need a preacher to tell you. Like, like you can just look around. You've got experience in this. You've, you've know, you know some people. Like, you look at their life and you're going... Man, they have got it all. It seems like, man, they went after it and they found it. Man, they, got, they went after like success and they got success. They went after money and they got the money. They went after the stuff and they got the stuff. And you listen to their story and they're like, man, they just seem like they're miserable. They just don't seem, seem happy at all. And so here's, here's what we do, though. We kind of turn a blind eye to that and go, well... Even though that is the story of so many, that has been the story over and over and over and over in history, but we, we don't want to think about that. We, we think, well, they just might have, they, okay, but I'm thinking that if I had that stuff, that I'd do it right. You just didn't do it right. Right? You, you just didn't make it out. Like, if I had that money, I, 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 I could make it work out so I wouldn't be so miserable as you. But yet, the story, this is the story of, uh, in, in, throughout history that you get what you want, that you, you go, go after it and you get it, and it just doesn't do it. It doesn't, it doesn't make you happy. And so this is, this is the, the life. And Paul is going, look, and I'm telling you, this is good for you. So, so studies have shown, like just not, I'm not talking Christian studies, right? I'm talking about just psychologists, like modern psychology. Studies have shown, uh, have been done to show us that you can go after your dreams, you can go after your comfort, you can go after pleasure, whatever it is, but there's going to come a time where whatever you're going after and you get it, the happiness factor of that, it will peak the, 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 the pleasure factor of that will peak. Like you, you go after whatever, whether it's, whether it's stuff, whether it's success, whether it's a title, whether it, it, money, whatever it is, that you go after and, and, it, and eventually that will peak and plateau. And then you keep going after it. It will, it will actually have the opposite effect and it will decline your happiness. Your, your, your satisfaction will be on the, uh, will, will, will decline. Your pleasure will decline. Let me just use some examples. Um, like a smartphone, right? Smartphones uh, been around a while now, and uh, we, I mean, they got some good things, right? We, we, we're, we got some benefits from having a smartphone. There's some good things come from that. There's a good thing attached to using a smartphone. Um, social media gets you connected to people that are not in your proximity that you're able to connect with. Um, it's convenient for accessing information. Smartphones are, are, are good for, you know, building community. Smartphones have been used in, and are being used to, as a tool to share the gospel and take the gospel to places in the world that we maybe we couldn't before. But what happens? And so we got like this incline, like we're, we're heading in the right direction. We got a smartphone we're heading in the right direction. It's, it's fulfilling some things for us. And, and so what, what happens? We use it enough that it, all of a sudden we become dependent on it. And when we become dependent on it, what happens? Well, isolation, feelings of isolation are on the increase. Depression is way up. FOMO is way up. All of a sudden, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really satisfied with the things that I have. I'm not really all that satisfied with the way that I look because of what I observe on my smartphone, suicide rates have gone way up. Or, or what about this? They've done studies on uh, like in education on class sizes. 
Like, what is the ideal class size for optimal learning? And so they've said, well, a class size can't be too big. So you need, so if you get too big, then it's, then it starts, it starts kicking, it starts going, it starts, it's not effective, but then you can't have too few because if you have too few, it's not effective or, or money. You know, a study was done a few years ago on, um, on emotional well-being and how much you make, like the connection between emotional well-being and, the, and how much you make. And, uh, and so if you think about um, what, what, they, what they decided, when they looked at all these different factors and said, okay, what's the ideal number that someone needs to make um, in order to peak out at emotional health, like well-being, like, like they're, they're good. And, uh, and so they looked at like, like 20,000. Well, that didn't do it. That wasn't enough. That, they, didn't, they didn't quite cut it. And, well, about 30,000. That, that wasn't enough. That, there were there were some challenges there in making 30,000 in our culture and uh, in our economy. And so what they'd found was that the sweet spot for anybody to, to have like, an, uh, like a, a healthy emotional like life or a healthy well, emotional well-being, it was $75,000. The person needed to make $75,000. They just figured, like, that. they looked at, like, that was kind of the sweet spot. And so, you know, what we do, we go, well, if $75,000 is, the, is, the, is, like, if that's the key to emotional well-being, then what could 100000 give me, right? This is what we do. And if 100000 like, maybe, like, 300000 but they said, actually, what happens is you, you're on your way to this place, this sweet spot, and then all of a sudden you make more than that. The more you go, it comes back down. Because all of a sudden, if you're making more, that usually means that you have more responsibilities at, job, at your job, which takes you out of some, some other areas that you're, that you're wanting to try to flourish in. Um, it, it, causes you to make you, it causes you to think about your status socially. It causes you to want more and think about what you have and what you don't have. It causes your kids to become spoiled. And so all of a sudden, what, you know, getting more and more of what, you, what was initially giving you some some, some, some flourishment, some health, some, some health, now all of a sudden it's kicking against you. And this is what Paul is saying. Pa- Paul is saying that the wisdom of the world, that in, in psych- and, and, and again, psychologists, are, I mean, this, they're just saying, like, the wisdom of the world is telling us this is a problem. That there's no such thing as unmitigated good, that once you get in the lane of that good thing that you think that you need, I'm just going to get in the lane of becoming successful, of having, getting this title, or, or whatever it might be, that once you get in the lane of that good thing, then you can just ride that thing all the way out and it will always only ever be good for you. Well, the truth is, eventually that good thing will kick against you. It will derail your life. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying that the wisdom of the world is telling us to go after more comfort, go after more square footage, go after newer and better things and newer and better experiences but you will find that that good thing will kick against you, that eventually that will, co- that will come after you. It will derail your life. And so Paul says, come down into the arena. It's good for you here. It's actually good for you. So you and I, we tend to think that when hardship comes our way, we, when we bump into suffering or you know, a, a, a difficult season in our life, that, we don't get what we want or we lose what we have, that somehow that's God punishing us. Whether that be a sickness or difficulties in relationship, whatever it is. But you need to understand, for the follower of Jesus Christ, hardship, suffering is never, never punishment. In fact, in those moments... In those, in those seasons, in that life of hardship, he is actually revealing to you out of his mercy that you desperately need him. Paul would say, this is why I can rejoice in my sufferings. I can rejoice in this life, in this life of being at the end of the line, being dragged into the arena. I can rejoice in this life. I'm not trying to get any pity from you because I'm telling you this is where it's at. This is where it's at. It's good for me. That it's good for you. You, you need some sleepless nights. You, you need those moments where you don't know if you're going to make it. It'll bring you to your knees. It'll make you pray better. It'll make you trust God more. It'll make you more compassionate to those who are hurting. It'll humble you. It will make you realize, had it not been for the Lord... Well, my enemies would have swallowed me up. But now that I've been through some stuff and I know that he is with me, I can keep going. 
I'm better for it. I, I can press on with what God has called me to do. So the first reason that we come out of the stands and into the arena, we go after downward mobility, is we go after this life that Paul describes because it's actually good for you. The second reason is because it's about the long game. It's about the long game. Now, our culture feeds on our desire to want what we want and get it right now. Our culture feeds and is making a killing off of our desires for immediate pleasure, instant gratification. We want something, we got it, we'll get it. If that means I got to go into debt to purchase what I want, I'm going to go into debt to purchase what I want because I want it right now. If that means risking my health in order to consume what I want right now, then I will, I will do that. I will, I will risk my health because I want what I want and I want it right now. But the way of Jesus, the life of a Christian, is about living for what's ahead. It's about living for what's coming. And so the life of a Christian, Christians, followers of Jesus, we will trade out the temporary for what is eternal. Jesus was, was faced with this. Matthew writes about this. He, you remember when Jesus was baptized, he was right at the beginning of his ministry. He goes to be baptized by John the Baptist, and immediately after he's baptized, this is a crazy, a crazy part of the story here of Jesus' life. You know, there's this voice that comes from heaven that says, this is my son with who I am well, what? You remember? I'm well pleased. And then immediately, immediately, God, the Holy Spirit takes Jesus out into the desert to be tempted for 40 days. He just told him, I'm pleased with him. And then it's off to the desert to be tempted for 40 days. Well, in the desert, when Jesus is tempted, one of the temptations that, that Jesus endured from um, Satan, from the devil, is it says that Matthew tells us that the devil took Jesus up into the, this high, the, the, a high mountain. And they're up on the mountain, and the devil shows Jesus the kingdoms of the earth. All the kingdoms of the earth, Matthew says. And it says, look. I'll give you all of this. I'll give you authority over all of these kingdoms in this world, in this earth, if you just bow down and worship me just right here, right now. Just bow down and worship me, and then the authority over kingdoms of all the earth, they're yours. And Jesus doesn't do it. And he goes on, and he, 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 he lives a sinless life, never giving in to the temptations of Satan, and he dies a death, a sacrificial death, and he rises from the dead. And, and then if you remember, right before he ascends back into heaven to be with God, to be with the Father, he gathers his disciples around, and the first thing that he tells them, as he gathers them around, he said, do you remember what he said? He says, now, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Everything that was offered to me by Satan then and so much more is now mine. It's all mine. This is, this is the way of Jesus. It's cross now, benefits later. The writer of Hebrews, he was, he was thinking about what was it? What was it that, that Jesus, I like kept Jesus going when he's, he knows what's ahead. Like he knows the beatings and the, the mockery and the, and, the, and the cross. He knows this is all ahead. What? him going. And here's how, we talk, here's how he explains it. He says, we're looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Like, what was Jesus thinking about in this moment? What was he thinking about when he thought about the cross that was coming? He's going, and, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, let me tell you what he was thinking about. He was thinking about the joy that's on the other side of the cross. That's what kept him going. The joy on the other side of the cross, the joy of knowing that people from the earth would glorify God because they would, their sins would be free. They would be reconciled to God through the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. And so he looked at that, and he looked at that one day, I'm going to be, I'm going to be seated with God, the Father, once again. And so he looked ahead. He lived for what was. He looked for what was ahead, and that kept him going in the moment. Listen, Paul is going to say in chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians that the resurrection of Jesus guarantees us two things. Guarantees us two things. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees us two things. One, Paul says that life in the arena, 
Where there is hardship and suffering, Paul says the resurrection of Jesus guarantees us that it won't always be this way. It won't always be this way. And two, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees us that there is unspeakable and eternal pleasure that is coming. And so Paul says, don't trade in 80 billion years of pleasure for just a few years of pleasure now. It's about the long game. The long game. The third reason that God has given us this life to live right now is because in this life, in this life, in the arena, God shows off his value. God shows off his worth, his value. In your weakness, in your suffering, God is showing the world that he is better than life. And there are times in your life where perhaps God will show off his power by bringing you through some impossible circumstances. But most often, the scripture gives witness to the fact that it's in the suffering, that it's in the hardship of life when he will let you suffer in order to show a watching world that he is indeed better than life. That God's glory is seen more spectacular in our suffering than in our victories. I've shared this before, but I often come back to this passage in, in Colossians. It's another, it's another letter that Paul wrote to some believers. And here's what he says in this, in this letter. He said this. He says, I rejoice. This is Paul. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh... I, and pay attention to what he's saying here because it's crazy. He says, in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking. Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. That's just crazy. That sounds, that's like Paul. Okay, you've been, maybe you've been like hit, punched one too many times. You know, like what is going on? What are you talking about? You're filling up. Something that is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Like, like Christ's afflictions are lacking anything. Like, like there's a gap. Like, like he died for sin, but there's some other things that need to be taken care of. And so Paul's like, I got to take care of some of that in my own suffering. What are you talking about? It seems like Paul, it, Paul is saying that Christ's suffering on the cross wasn't enough to pay for my sin. But that is not what Paul is saying. Paul over and over and over says that if you and I could be saved by doing anything, if we, if we could be saved by being good enough, if we could be saved by being religious enough, then Christ's death was worthless. When Paul says, in my body, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for your sake, what he's saying is, by me suffering as a follower of Jesus and you suffering as a follower of Jesus, we are extending Jesus' death on the cross for our sins to those that he died for. In other words, Christ died for millions of people in the world, for the unreached people groups, for those that, that, that where there is no trace of the gospel, no clue who Jesus, they have no clue who Jesus is. Jesus died for the people in your family. Jesus died for the people in your neighborhood. He, Jesus died for your coworkers. Jesus died for them, and they don't know it. They don't feel it. They can't say that Jesus is their Savior. There's something missing. The good news that Jesus died to save them is just not connecting with them. And you would think that Paul would then say, well, just go tell them. Just go tell them. But that's not what he says. Paul says, it's through the sufferings in my body that the sufferings of Jesus arrive to the people in my neighborhood. It's through the sufferings. It's through watching me suffer and seeing that God is worth it. That the sufferings in my body that I go through, the sufferings that I walk through in this arena of following Jesus, it's through that that God uses to bring the suffering, the gospel, to the people in my neighborhood, in my job, to my family, and to my friends. Now, listen, I know that you and I want to be in this group where we've just convinced ourselves that somehow God will, people are going to want to follow Jesus because of how great my life is going. Like, that's what we want, right? Like, look at how awesome my life is. Well, how is it so awesome? And we could just say, well, it's Jesus. 
And everybody's going, well, I want some of that, right? And it's like, that's the group I want to belong to. Like, I want, the, I want to be in the group that it's like, you look at my great life and come to know Jesus. I don't want to be in the group that says, come to my awful, <laughs> difficult, hard life and come to know who Jesus is. Like, that's what we think. That's what we, that's what we want. Uh, it's, it's like someone's going to look at your great life and go, hey, I want what you have. And listen, and they probably do. But what they want is not Jesus. What they want is your great life. And the Bible has a word for that. The word is idolatry. Of course I'll have Jesus if, if it gets me a new car, right? I mean, who wouldn't want a Jesus who gives, them, gives me wealth or a well-behaved kids or a great marriage? We want that life. We want to be the guy that wins the championship and says, hey, 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 before all this stuff, I just want to say, I just want to thank the Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Like, we want to be that guy, right? We want to win in everything and say, hey, to God be the glory. Like, that's what we want. That's what, that, like, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Look, something good happens. Like, you get, like, good things. Like, we want to stop and say, hey, all glory to God for this. So, it's March Madness, right? March Madness. Um, it's what gets us through 18 degree weather, right? In March. Like this is, this is what we have. And so um, March Madness, and, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I'll never forget watching a few years ago where there was one team that squeaked through. It was one of those, it's what's great about, the, about March Madness is watching these nobody teams or these teams that did, didn't seem to have a chance and they make their way up, they climb their way up. And so there was one of those teams a few years ago and uh, they made it to the final four. And in the final four game, they are keeping up. I mean, it's a, they're playing, I think it was, they were playing Villanova that year, which was the elite team of, uh, like, like everybody expected them to win. And, uh, and so they're playing, they're playing Villanova, and, and in the final seconds, in the, I mean, they were like neck and neck, and in the final seconds of the game, there was, a, there was an obvious missed call by the refs for double, double dribbling. And, uh, and I mean, who knows, but... It seemed, that it seemed like the game could have gone the other way, but instead they lost this game. So after the game, in the press conference, the coach is asked about the call and, and, and how disappointing that must have been, and, and here's what he said. He said, sometimes the calls are going to go your way, and sometimes they're not going to go your way. <laughs> but listen to this. He says, so what, are we going to give God any less glory because we lost or are we only going to give him glory when we win? And the room got quiet. That's because the world doesn't know what to do with that. When somebody, when somebody gets sick, somebody gets hurt, when somebody suffers and praises God in the midst of it, well, the world doesn't know what to do with that. You see, because glorifying God means showing by your actions and showing by your attitude that God is valuable, that God is precious, that God is desirable, that God is all-satisfying. And the greatest way to show that someone satisfies your heart is to keep on rejoicing in them when everything else is being stripped away. And so how does the gospel arrive at your job? Through your suffering. How does the gospel arrive to your neighbor? Through your suffering. How does the gospel get to your friends? They get there through your suffering. That's why Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in my own flesh. It's no coincidence that the places in the world where Christianity is growing the fastest are the places where suffering for the name of Jesus is the greatest. And you and I need to understand that when God saved us, when God saved us, he, that uh, salvation did not end on us. Like I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I'm, God is with me, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, it's all good, now I can just go you know, live my life. Yes, listen, when God saved you, he adopted you into his family. We are sons and daughters of God, and that is beautiful. But when God saved you, he also sent you. 
He, he sent you as mission. He received you into his family as sons and daughters, but he also sent you as missionaries to make known the good news of Jesus, the gospel, to your neighbors, to your friends, to the world. So that every day that you wake up and you go to work, every day that you wake up and go to school, go to your meetings, go to your appointments, hanging out with friends, God, you're not just going to work, you're not just going to hang out with your, God is sending you there as missionaries to bring the name of Jesus into those places. And the life of a missionary is a, and it's a life of risk. It's a life of suffering. All around the world, missionaries are experiencing pain and sickness and tension in their marriage and tension with their neighbors and with people in their, in their communities and, and opposition from the enemy. This is why scripture says, hey, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you face fiery troubles. But rejoice in your sufferings because the glory of God is being revealed in the fire through your life. So how else will people know that Jesus is what is most satisfying to us if it looks like money is what is most satisfying to us? How else will people know that Jesus is the most satisfying in, 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 uh, that we, in the world, in our, in our, the most all-satisfying in our life if, it's just, if, if comfort looks like it's what's satisfying us? Some of you are going, that's even... That sounds like a miserable life. Some of you are going, I brought somebody here today. And I'm like, you're killing me, man. But listen, the call to follow Jesus is not a call to a miserable life, but it is a call to lay out your life. This is why all throughout Scripture it says rejoice in suffering. Suffering brings hope. It's the joy of the Lord where I find my strength. If you want to know that kind of joy, then lay out your life for somebody else. Take a risk with what God has given you. Take a risk with your life. Take a risk with your money. Take a risk with your education. And pour it all out for the name of Jesus. That you can say, my life is being poured out as an offering to God. That this life that I live, yeah, I live it in the body, but I live it by faith and the Son of God who gave himself up for me. This is an amazing thing that, we have been, that God has called us to. But as Paul says, you have to be willing to become a fool. Downward mobility. Becoming one who doesn't chase after the, the things that, listen, that good people chase after. To not go after honor and strength and bigger and more and better. To bless those who revile you. To lean into those who slander you. To lay aside this idea that God is most glorified in my awesome life that I want to project to my friends and family and on social media. But instead, trust that God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. That people will see the worth and the beauty and the reality of the gospel when I do not have the things that the culture says you got to have in order to be satisfied. And yet, I am satisfied. Because I know who I am. I know whose I am. And I know what's coming. So practically, what does this look like? What does it look like to live in the arena? In 2023 in America. Well, here's, here's some things that I'm just saying it, it could look like. It, it, it could look like being in a marriage where one of you is a believer and one of you is not. And you're following Christ and your spouse is not following Christ. It's going to bring about a measure of suffering. It, it looks like getting yourself around people who are not just like you. Getting outside of people that are just, they look like you, they vote like you, they act like you, they believe like you, but it's building intentional relationships with those that see, see the world very different than you see the world. And at the same time, it looks like getting into the community, into community with the bride of Christ, the church, laying down your pride and submitting your life to followers of Jesus. 
It looks like looking out into the world and seeing the poor and you see the disabled, you see the people in painful marriages, you see it and you can either just ignore it or you can enter into those broken places, the dark places and offer hope and help in the name of Jesus. And when your treasure is Jesus and, and you desire, your desire is to live a life pleasing to the Lord, there will come some convictions that you have that if you live those convictions out, they can bring upon you some suffering. For example, you look at what the Scripture teaches about worth and value, the worth and value of life, as every person is created in the image of God. And it's not just a quiet conviction. It's not just something that you keep to yourself, but it's something that you step into to protect life. That could, like, that could look like opening your home to those, to children or in a hard season, or coming alongside those who do and being a constant encouragement and support. Or it looks like when people around you know that the baby in your womb has little to no chance of survival outside the womb and you carry that baby all the way to the end. The possibilities of making much of Jesus are incredible. Or when you raise your children to be followers of Jesus and not, be, and not to be the most athletic or the most popular kid, that when you decide to say no to the tyranny of certain opportunities for your children that puts up barriers for your family and for your children to be conformed to the image of Christ, when you parent intentionally prioritizing Jesus and his church, there will be a measure of suffering in the way that you parent. Listen, the aim of God in creating the universe, the aim of God in creating you, the aim of God in creating your family, your parents, your schools, and this world, the aim of God in creating all of it was to display the greatness of his glory, particularly his grace through the sufferings of his son. Jesus said, anyone who would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. That's not just a throwaway statement. Anyone who would follow me, come down into the arena. Take up your cross and follow me. And so Jesus, and so Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf. I complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in my own body. And so on behalf of Jesus, Paul says, I plead with you to come down from the stands with everybody else in Caesar and into the arena for the sake of your own joy. For the sake of those who don't even know yet. And maybe they know some information, maybe they've, they've heard of Jesus and his sufferings, but it's just, it's not connected with what, that what he has done is for them. He's not their savior It's more than just opening up your mouth, and it includes opening up your mouth, but it's more than that. It's your life. In fact, Paul says at the end of this chapter, he says, for the kingdom of God does not exist in talk, but in power. And Paul is saying there are so many nations and so many of your friends and your family that, you, that need you to take some risks, to admit to your weaknesses, to show that you're not the hero of your story, but Jesus is. Showing them that through your life, not simply your talk, but through your life, the reality and the power of the gospel. I know, I know, this is a, it's a hard sermon. It's a hard call. But do you know how, Christian, listen to me, do you know how I know this is possible? You know how I know that this is possible? This isn't just like, a well, yeah, that would be nice, or yeah, that's great for Paul. But how, you know how I know that Paul can call us to this and say, this is the life of a Christian? You know how I know this is possible? Because you, Christian, have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Your life is so intertwined with the life of Jesus that, that Jesus describes it this way. One time he described it this way. He, he's he, he, trying to describe like how, how the, his followers, like those that belong to him and his life, like how they're, and he, he describes it this way. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
Like, he, like you get your life through me. Like my life sustains your life. That your life is so intertwined with my life that this is, it's, it's like you're, the very lifeblood of you is, is coming, flowing from me. Jesus, or Paul, he was trying to describe this whole thing. He was trying to describe this whole relationship. Like, how, how are we in? Like, how does this all work? And so he doesn't even know how to describe it. And so he just makes it up. He just makes up this term and says, you're just in Christ. You're just in Christ. Like, you are so, like, interconnected that you're just in Christ. And listen, and the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of you, th- this, this life that, 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 that we are called to, that, that, that this life in the arena of following Jesus that, that is being sustained by Christ himself, you need to understand that, that the Holy Spirit of God in you wants that life. Like, wants that life. Like, I know there's, like, our flesh, like, I'm not with you. I'm going, I don't know if I want that. But the Holy Spirit of God in me says, I want that. That's what I want. Because that's what's going to bring God glory. That's what's going to bring Stephen the most joy in this life. I know you don't see it. I know it doesn't make any sense to you. I know it's counterintuitive. I know it goes against everything that you're taught and everything that you see. But the Holy Spirit of God in you and in me says, that's the life that I want. And he can and he will give you the courage and the strength to step out from the stands and into the arena so that you would not waste your life. But to live this life knowing the freedom and joy that comes in following Jesus. Jesus.